भद्रम करने भी सुनिया मदेवा भद्रम बसीना क्षगरी जत्रा स्तिरे रंगे स्तुष्टु आम सस्तनी भी ये सही मदेव की तमेवायु सस्ती न इंद्र रुद्ध सवाहा सस्ती न पुष्पा विशेदा सस्ती न स्ताक्षु वरिष्ठ में सस्ती न अभिकुश पदे प्रेतार ओम शांति शांति Now this is a very important class for several reasons. One reason is that this is perhaps the last class on this particular text, because after this class, we will have no class on Friday, the Old Temple till March the fourteenth, two thousand fourteen, because I will be away, so. Uh, up on March 14, perhaps we will start another text. So this text we will conclude today. <coughs> so I would say something about the order, the text, and its place in world thoughts. I already explained at the very beginning that this work, Kavadapada's Karika, was written. In the sixth century A.D., <coughs> you have to think of the age of Saint Augustine. Maybe about hundred years or eighty years after Saint Augustine's time, the book plays it occupies a very important place in the history of in the evolution of Indian philosophy because this is the first systematic exposition of. Non-dualistic philosophy in modern times. Please remember, this is not the beginning of non-dualism or Advaita philosophical tradition, but this was a landmark work. It was a turning point in the history of Vedantic thought, Eastern philosophical tradition. <coughs> The work itself, as I said earlier, was called Gaudapada Karika. Gaudapada is the name of the author who lived in sixth century A.D. Karika is a is a technical work, is a commentary on a shorter technical work written not in prose but in verse. So it is a commentary in verse. Uh, the author uh, is a very important figure in India's philosophical tradition. <clears throat> as many of you may have heard, Indian philosophy as we find it today has got an almost an unbroken succession of traditional teachers who handed over this philosophical tradition from generation to generation of. Students and teachers, beginning with say around third millennium BC, that means almost for five five thousand years. For example, in the last class we dealt with Sankhya philosophy attributed to Kapila. Kapila is said to have lived around third millennium BC, <clears throat> and Vedantic tradition is. Even more older. In this tradition, there is one central figure who, for the first time, built up the entire edifice of Vedanta philosophy as a compact, well-defined metaphysical system. His name was Shankaracharya, who lived around 150 years after the. Period of a present order, Gaudapada. <clears throat> so there is a an ancient verse we gives a list of the great teachers in Vedantic tradition, and also gives an idea of the succession of teachers right from early. Prehistoric times onwards, 
that verse i shall read it's very important to remember the succession the tradition of vedanta philosophy as we understand it today to appreciate this antiquity and this unbroken spiritual succession you can read swami vivekananda's works <clears throat> as most of you know swami ji came to america in 1893 to attend the parliament of religion and there he gave a most wonderful rational and scientific exposition of vedantic thought and that was the beginning of the flow of eastern wisdom to western world in fact vivekananda was some kind of a bridge between the east and west and today if you walk in the streets of san francisco if you find yoga studios if you find people practicing yoga if you find people practicing zen meditation buddhism or any kind of eastern religious metaphysical system it's all because swami vivekananda opened the royal highway and a succession of great teachers followed the path which he inaugurated which he opened up in 1893 <clears throat> the buddhism is uh, technically i mean academically studied as a separate branch of thought its source is the upanishads which swami vivekananda taught in western world so from that time onwards you find a co- constant succession of different meditation techniques philosophical traditions spiritual traditions flowing to us western world the occidental world from the orient <clears throat> now if you read swami vivekananda's complete works and if we read his earlier lectures in the parliament of religions starting with the inaugural address welcomed the you know, i mean the inaugural address in 80 that is in, in september 11 1893 and if we go through the suc- the succeeding presentations like paper on hinduism and so on why we disagree all these important well known talks you find swami vivekananda never mentions the name of his guru he never mentions sidamakrishna <coughs> but if you read vivekananda's life and teachings swami ji says i am an instrument in my master's hands vivekananda himself says i have not taught anything i am just an instrument in my master's hands and his master was swami was sri ramakrishna paramahamsa but in his talks and lectures especially in western world he very rarely mentions sri ramakrishna and later on he stressed again and again he repeatedly said asserted i have taught nothing but the upanishads vivekananda says again and again i have taught nothing but the upanishads so you can see this uh, the, the i mean this apparent contradiction see swami vivekananda who considered himself to be a humble disciple and prophet heralder evangelist of sri ramakrishna paramahamsa rarely mentions sri ramakrishna's names in his earlier lectures and later he asserted i have taught nothing but the upanishads what he did was first he taught the universal spiritual teachings of the upanishads vedanta and then he presented sri ramakrishna's teachings and life as the best demonstration illustration of the teachings of vedanta so he first presented the universal teachings of vedanta and upanishads which is part of a long ageless ancient tradition and then after presenting these universal vedantic teachings he presents sri ramakrishna later on as the best illustration of these vedantic teachings in modern times so people were very much fascinated now swami vivekananda said again and again that vedanta doesn't begin with one individual 
Vedanta is eternal, ageless, a philosophical, spiritual tradition which comes down to us from the ancient teachers. And Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda are, Veda, are the modern teachers, exponents, prophets of the Vedantic tradition. So you have to remember, it begins not with an individual, it is an ancient tradition. But still, there is a uh, well-accepted succession of teachers mentioned, which is, and this, uh, this succession is mentioned in a beautiful verse, which is chanted at, at the beginning of any discussion with Vedanta in scholarly circles in India. The verse I shall chant and then I shall explain. That will give us an idea of the antiquity and the spiritual tradition of Vedanta. Now we do not, right now we do not have any clear-cut unbroken succession of teachers mentioned in any books right from See, Thales, who lived the 7th century, was the most celebrated uh, Greek philosopher who lived in 7th century uh, BC, who lived even before Buddha. But we do not have an unbroken succession, what in Sanskrit is called parampara, an unbroken succession of teachers, students, and their students, and like that, an unbroken succession of teachers, we do not have uh, such a tradition in Western philosophical tradition. Uh, if at all we had, it came to an end almost with Plotinus, the great Neoplatonist, Plotinus and Philo. But in Vedanta, there is an unbroken succession of the great saints and sages who taught this universal wisdom which Vivekananda brought to this country in the later half of the last decade of 19th century. Sorry, in the form, in the earlier half. He brought it here in 1893. In, so in the former half of the last decade of 19th century. Now where does this tradition come from? What we were discussing in, in these classes. Where is the original source? Where is it coming from? As I said, it is eternal. Still there is a succession of teachers mentioned. This is the verse. Narayanam Padmbhuvam Vasishtam Shaktim Cha Tat Putra Parasharam Cha Vyasam Shukam Gaudapadam Mahantam Govinda Yogindra Madhasya Sishyam Sri Shankaracharya Madhasya Padmapadam Cha Hastam Alagam Cha Sishyam Tam Todagam Vartika Karam Anyan Asmat Gurun Santadam Anatosmi This is the famous verse. It gives a very simple verse. Being, the verse says, this philosophical tradition begins with God. So to indicate, to denote, to, to clearly express the fact it is eternal. It is not a man-made system of thought like Marxist philosophy of Karl Marx or Engels or German idealism of Kant or utilitarianism of J.S. Mill or Bentham, nothing like that. So it begins with God himself. Narayana is not a name of a particular person. It denotes the eternal spiritual reality, the eternal spiritual principle. <clears throat> and then from that eternal spiritual principle from God, a few important figures who represent different stages in the evolution of Vedantic philosophy is mentioned here. So, then Brahma, Vasishtha, Shakti, Parashara, Vyasa, Shuka, etc. All these great teachers are mentioned. And then after mentioning Shuka, last time, in the, you may remember in the last class we mentioned the great teacher of Bhagavata Purana, when Parikshit asked the question, death is staring at my, at my face, what should I do? Whom should I meditate? 
how I should lead the rest of my life. I have, I have got only seven days to live. I, I mentioned this story. And then in response to this question, the great sage Sukha gave an answer. That answer we can get in the form of the great devotional classic Bhagavata Purana. That Sukha is mentioned here. He is one of the great teachers. And then Gaudapada. Gaudapada is the author of this work. Gaudapada's good uh, disciple was Govinda Bhagavad Pada. And Govinda Bhagavad Pada's Sishya disciple was Shankaracharya. So Shankaracharya occupied the central position. Before that there were several teachers and after him also there are, there are several teachers. And then where is the last link? The last link is our own teacher. Asmat Gurun Santatamanatosmi. As my guru, my own teachers. So starting from the eternal reality, Brahman or Atman, or God himself, this eternal spiritual tradition, as a flow has come down to us, like the river flowing from the, from the high mountains, flowing for thousands of miles before it joins the ocean. Like that, this tradition, eternal tradition, it doesn't end with us. But it has come to us through this succession of teachers and students. This is mentioned here. Among those great teachers, Gaudapada's name is mentioned. That is an important principle to remember. Now, that's why great teachers like Shankaracharya has mentioned this great philosopher's name. Gaudabada's name, Atroktam Vedanta Artha Sampradaya Vidpiki Acharyehi Anadimaya Supta, etc. It means, Shankarajari mentions, so as I said earlier, these great teachers who knew the philosophical spiritual tradition of eternal truth have come down to us. Now, <clears throat> now I would say something concerning this book. I already said at the very beginning, one uniqueness of this book is that it analyzes the supreme reality in the light of our everyday experiences. That's why it's so very logical. The totality of our experiences spread over three states of consciousness, the waking state, the dream state, and the deep sleep state. What we experience in waking state we do not see in dreams. What we see in dreams and waking states, we do not experience in deep sleep state. But at the same time, our dreams are influenced by the experiences and tendencies that we have gathered in waking state. You can never have a dream which is completely separated, which is completely detached divorced, entirely cut off, distinct and different from your waking state experiences. But your waking state experiences are different from dream state. In waking state, it takes five hours for you to reach New York from here, six hours. But in dream state, in split second, our mind travels 3,500 miles. Well, well, in waking state, we are walking in the streets of San Francisco. When we dream, we feel we have, dream, we have reached Russia or China or some other. We have, our mind has traveled thousands of miles. So, and again, waking experiences are somewhat gross in nature. Dream experiences are somewhat subtle because in waking state, experiences are related to the five senses of perception and mind. We see something when our eyes and mind come together. We hear something when ears and mind come together. We can touch something only when the sense of touch and mind come together. So the, there is a grossness about the experiences of waking state. But in dream state, all this happens at a subtle level. Everything is a projection of the mind. You are sleeping, it's pitch dark everywhere. You are sleeping in a small room with eyes closed and you see yourself walking 
under the burning sun in a desert, you'd see a huge truck moving. But you are, you are, you are in a small room. But you can, you find yourself uh, seeing a huge truck moving, or you see yourself riding an elephant. All these examples you find. So, uh, in dream state, the, everything is subtle. But then, this difference is there. But there is also another fact to be remembered. Your dream experiences can never be completely different from waking state experiences. Because what we gather in waking state becomes subtle tendencies and impressions remain in the mind and they come to the surface in dreams. And these experiences of waking state are relived, re-experienced in dreams. But everything happens at the mental level. Your five senses of perception are inactive. Your five senses of act action are inactive. Only mind is projecting different images like in the film. So, Gaudapada says, waking state and dream state are different. But in deep sleep, you don't see anything. Everything is merged in thick, in a thick veil of ignorance or darkness. Now, Gaudapada says, there is a difference with regard to what is seen, what is experienced in the three states of experiences. But there is no difference at all with regard to the one who sees, the one who experiences, the one who goes through all these experiences. That's why when we wake up from dream, we are able to remember what we dreamed. So, the dreamer is the same person as the one who was experiencing things in waking state. The same reality. And when you go to deep sleep state, you don't see anything. There is no experiencer, active experiencer. But that experiencer is present there. That's why when we come back to the waking state after a complete, a restful, deep sleep, we are able to experience the joy, the restfulness, the relaxation that accompany the state of deep sleep. I had a wonderful rest. I had a wonderful deep sleep. So the experiencer is the same. In Sanskrit, it's called drashta, the subject. But what is experienced is different. Drishyam, which is called what is experienced, what is seen. The objects are different. Now, Gaudabada says, this shows that the experiencer in waking state, in dream state, and deep sleep state is the same. But experienced, seen objects, experiences are different. Now, what undergoes changes cannot be real. Because what is experienced in waking state is not experienced in the same manner in dreams and everything is absent. Nothing is present in deep sleep. Therefore, they are not real. But the drashta, the subject, the witness, the, the experiencer, the seer is the same. Therefore, this reality is one. This reality, when analyzed through the prism of waking state, is called Vishwa. Well, in association with the experiences of dream state, is called Taijasa. In association with the deep sleep state, is called Prajna. So, technical terms. We don't worry, I have already explained in early classes. This is the only conclusion. In reality, the experiencer remains the same. The, so the experiencer doesn't belong to any of these three states. See, I can give an example. Suppose there is a 
there is a structure with three rooms, one built above the other. And if you are the owner of the structure, the building, you will have full freedom to move from one for the first floor to second floor or third floor, as you like. You do not belong to any of the three rooms, because if you belong to any of them, you won't be seen the other place. Since you are present in all the three places, you do not belong to any of the three places. Your state, your status is independent. It is your status is not inseparably related to any of the three places. So, at the highest level, we understand that the subject is real. Sri Ramakrishna, from another angle, puts this idea in a very simple illustration. Well, to simplify, I mean, to, give, to look at that illustration from another angle, suppose you are staying in a house, your friend comes to the house, and he finds the gate is built of bricks, red bricks. And, well, when he, uh, when he sees the gate from outside, he may find, well, this gate, the opening door, the gate is made of red brick. And then there's a gravel road. Then he finds that also is made of red brick. Then he enters the first floor, then you find that that floor is also made of red brick. Still, he is not sure about the second and third floors. And when he enters the second floor, then he suddenly realizes it is made of the same brick of which the gate is made. And finally, when he reaches the, ter the top, the terrace, he finds everything is made of red brick only. So, the reality is present everywhere, but the reality is independent of all these three states. That reality is the eternal, everlasting Atman or consciousness, the soul. That is Gaudapada's theory. It is called avasthatraya vicharaka or avasthatraya pratkriya, a particular method of approach which Gaudapada develops in this particular text. The origin of this approach could be found in the two Upanishads of Chandogya and Brihadaranika. But it was Gaudapada who for the first time developed this approach. We, if we want to know what we are, we can scientifically and rationally analyze our own inner experiences and then come to a conclusion what we are. Uh, if you are the body, well, the body is, is as good as dead in deep sleep. And that body is different from the body that you associate with waking state. So body cannot be eternal. Mind also. Mind is inactive, inert, unconscious in deep sleep. But it is active in waking and dream states. So we can't be mind. So we are something beyond body, beyond mind, beyond intellect. We are something which transcends all these three states. But that Atman, that consciousness is present in all the three states. But all these three states are only modes of expression of this reality. The reality is beyond all this. That is Godavada's theory. This approach he developed in this particular text. Then one special characteristic of this technical book is that Gaudapada uh, wrote this work uh, at a time when the two prominent schools of Buddhist philosophy were very prominent in India. In fact, both of them are still in, uh, uh, very much active in today's America. One is subject to idealism of Vijnanavada, Yogacara, the other is doctrine of emptiness which called Sunyavada. So most of the meditation techniques, the practice of emptying the mind, the practice of 
mindless the mindlessness the practice of weakness ship with you you uh, conceive of yourself as the witness of everything not a participant so all these meditation techniques relaxation techniques rather are all offshoots uh, they are all um, they have all sprung from two prominent schools of ancient buddhist tradition philosophical tradition one is the subject to idealism it's called vijnanavada the other is the doctrine of emptiness shunyavada vijnanavada teaches that the external world external objects are unreal everything is momentary but vijnanavada also teaches that there is a platform of tendencies and impressions that go through which is called ale vijnanavada but that is also relatively only relatively permanent because it is momentary eternally changing fleeting sensations and impressions and images so gurudeva says if you argue that external objects are unreal and if you also argue that what witnesses what experiences the non existence of external things is also unreal or momentary then how do you ra- how do you rationally explain the momentariness of momentary things because relativity can only be understood in the context of something which is non relative momentariness of something of external objects can be understood only in the context of against the background of something which is not momentary which is permanent suppose you are traveling in train both trains are moving at the same speed you find you are stuck you are in a static condition you you can feel the moment of the train which is running close to you if you are if both of you are both the trains are moving at the same speed if one train is standing if the other train is moving then you can feel the movement of the train the moving train similarly momentariness of external things can be understood only against the background of something which is not momentary which is eternal now gurudeva says that eternal reality is atman turiya so that reality which is present in all the three states of waking dream and deep sleep states still not inseparably associated with these three states they are associated but not inseparably because that reality has got a separate independent ontological status it is eternal witness the eternal subject that is godavada sansa so godavada says vijnanavadins or subjective idealists suffer from a very serious flaw from a metaphysical angle because they are not able to posit one eternal subject and witness so that's the problem the second school of philosophy which was very prominent during gaudavada's time was the doctrine of emptiness which is called shunyavada its greatest exponent was nagarjuna the classical work is madhyamika karika sometimes called mool madhyama shastram like that you find these books these books have got plenty of translations perhaps they have been translated into french german different languages especially after the flight of the great tibetan lamas from tibet after the invasion of tibet by china a large number of great learned lamas migrated to europe mostly to britain and france and also to america they have translated many of these great books ancient texts from tibetan or in sanskrit language into english so the prominent work of 
ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ಐಡಿಯಲಿಸ್ ಆರ್ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನವಾದ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಯೋಗಾಚಾರ ಭೂಮಿ ಲೈಕ್ ಲಂಕಾವತಾರ ದೇರ್ ಇನ್ಯೂಮರಬಲ್ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ವೆರ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ವೆರಿ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಥಿಂಗರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫಿಲಾಸಫರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನವಾದ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ಐಡಿಯಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ ವಸುಬಂಧು ಧರ್ಮಗೀರ್ತಿ ನಿಗ್ನಾಗ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೋನ್ ನೋ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದ ದ ಡಾಕ್ಟ್ರಿನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಮ್ಟಿನೆಸ್ ಸೊ ಯು ಆಫನ್ ಫೈನ್ ಟುಡೇ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಇನ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ ಮೆಟ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಟ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಆನ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಇನ್ಫರ್ಮನೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಂಪರಿಕಲ್ ಫಿನಾಮಿನ ದಟ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ಸ್ ಯು ಟು ಎಮ್ ಟಿ ಯುವರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಗೆಟ್ಸ್ ಆಕ್ಯುಪೈಡ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಸಫರಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೇನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪೇನ್ ವೆನ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅಬ್ಸಸ್ಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಸಮ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟರ್ನಲ್ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಓರ್ ವೆನ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅಬ್ಸಸ್ಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಸಮ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನಲ್ ಸೆನ್ಸೇಷನ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ದಿ ದಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಮೇನ್ ಕಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾನ್ಫ್ಲಿಕ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೇನ್ಸ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ವರೀಡ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಮೇ ಹ್ಯಾಪನ್ ಟು ಯು ಓ ಟು ಅನದರ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ರೀಡ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಸೀ ಓರ್ ಯು ಮೇ ವರಿ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಂಗರ್ ಥರ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಡಿಸಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಂಗ್ಸೈಟಿ ಮೇಲಂಕಳಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೋ ಆನ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ವರೀಡ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟರ್ನಲ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ವರೀಡ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನಲ್ ಸೆನ್ಸೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಇಮೋಷನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫೀಲಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕಾನ್ಸಂಟ್ರೇಟ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಮೊಮೆಂದರಿನೆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫೈನಲಿ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಕಾನ್ಸಂಟ್ರೇಟ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಮ್ಟಿನೆಸ್ ಯು ಫೀಲ್ ಎ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಮೆಂಟಲ್ ರಿಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಎ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಸೈಕೊಲಾಜಿಕಲಿ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಬಟ್ ಫಿಲಾಸೋಫಿಕಲಿ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಗುಡ್ ಅಪ್ ಅದರ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ಔಟ್ ದ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಮ್ಟಿನೆಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಒನ್ ಸೀರಿಯಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಎ ಲಾಜಿಕಲ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ವ್ಯೂ ಸೇ ದೋಸ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ಹೋಲ್ಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಮ್ಟಿನೆಸ್ ದೇ ಸೇ ಅಟ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಫ್ ನಿರ್ವಾಣ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಲಿಬರೇಷನ್ ಯು ಫೀಲ್ ಬ್ಲಿಸ್ಫುಲ್ನೆಸ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಪರ್ಪಸ್ ಇನ್ ಫ್ಯಾಟ್ when you meditate when you empty your mind of all disturbing thoughts and anxiety you feel a kind of internal relaxation which is called peacefulness happiness etc at the highest level when this experience becomes a permanent experience called liberation it's called nirvana according to buddhist tradition and then you feel the blissfulness of nirvana liberation emancipation who enjoys who experiences this blissfulness at the time of liberation if everything is empty subject is empty object is empty external things are unreal we are also unreal then but there should be some reality who enjoys this blissfulness associated with spiritual liberation or nirvana godapada says it is this atman when we realize our true nature we are not this body or mind or anything we are the immanent reality atman consciousness present everywhere the inner reality the inner resident present everywhere when we realize our transcendental nature then sufferings losses uh, problems associated with daily life hunger or thirst anger disappointment all these will not affect us because we go beyond it we don't negate it we go beyond it negation is go different from transcending when we transcend the lower identities like i am the body i am the mind etc then we feel permanent eternal happiness and joy that joy is not momentary joy it is a state of blissfulness which makes you feel there is nothing more to be achieved there is nothing more to be attained that's a real sign of spiritual growth you may work you may have you may you may be working for a for a definite goal something to be achieved you may put all your energy and attention everything but if you don't get it it won't shock you that's a real sign of spirituality a spiritual person doesn't simply sit somewhere 
uh, and without doing anything. In fact, there is a feeling and there is a wrong notion. In fact, that idea was sometimes uh, presented as an object, as an objection in in the commentaries on uh, Bhagavad Gita. I shall give an example to point out this fact. What is the real uh, character of a spiritually liberated person? I give this example. I took the example from Bhagavad Gita, second chapter. The last 18 verses of the second chapter uh, constitute a description of the characteristics of a spiritually illumined soul. See the preconception on his call. So there, there is a picture of a spiritually liberated person, a person who has attained nirvana. Apuri manam achala pradishtam samudra maapa pravishandi yedu tadduka maayam pravishandi sarve sa shantim apnodi na kama kami. See the last part of this sloka verse is saha shantim apnodi. He or she attains peace. The peace you should write with capital letter P. It is not a peacefulness in a very empirical or phenomenal sense. It's a, not in empirical sense, in transcendental sense. So who attains peace? The picture is given. You have to think of an ocean, an innumerable rivers, hundreds of rivers, empty their waters into that ocean. The ocean remains totally undisturbed. The ocean doesn't block the rivers. No, don't come and disturb me. No. The ocean doesn't go out and invite the rivers. Please bring your waters to me. No. The ocean remains undisturbed. The ocean is not inactive because it accepts, it welcomes the rivers. It doesn't block their flow. But it doesn't get, it doesn't get overflowed. It's not affected. It doesn't seek, it doesn't avoid. So, a spiritually enlightened person will be extremely humanistic in his approach. He will not become insensitive. He becomes sensitive in a higher spiritual sense. He may work for the good of all. He may put all his energy and time, everything for the good of others. The only difference is he or she is not affected. Now, Gaudapada says, if the doctrine of emptiness is a sound system of philosophy, a logical approach, then the question arises as to who enjoys this blissfulness associated with nirvana. Gaudapada says, at the time of liberation, according to Advaita Vedanta, we realize the fact that we are the all-pervading consciousness, the eternal spiritual reality, which is present in everything, in an amoeba and also in a Buddha. See, Swami Vivekananda's famous statement is that the difference between an amoeba and Buddha is not one of degrees, but one of, sorry, not one of kind, but one of degrees. The difference between an amoeba and Buddha is one of degrees, not of kind. An amoeba, in amoeba, this consciousness, this Atman is manifesting in a low degree. In a Buddha, Buddha literally in Sanskrit, Buddha means the enlightened one. Buddha could mean Jesus, Tamaushna Paramahamsa, Shankaracharya, Vivekananda, any liberated, any spiritually enlightened person. That's the meaning of Buddha. Buddha means the enlightened one. So in a spiritually enlightened person like Buddha, this Atman manifests in his full effulgence. Now, Gaudapada says, at the time of liberation, we feel that we are one with the whole creation. We are one with the entire humanity. So that is the the bag, I mean, the earlier part of the text which Gaudapada uh, deals with. Now, towards the end, in the fourth chapter of the book, Gaudapada 
establishes its doctrine of non-origination that I already mentioned earlier. Uh, this, for that, uh, to expound this idea, he gives the illustration, the simile, it's called the fire circle simile, alata chakra. Alata means a fire, a torch. Suppose you are holding in your hand a lighted torch. If you go on rotating the torch, the torch, the, the fire, the, the torch creates a fire circle. And you feel you are holding in your hand a, a wheel made of fire. But the moment you start rotating slowly, that wheel, the circle vanishes. Similarly, names and forms and sensations, all this moving one after another, create the impression that there is this world. In reality, if you look at the true nature of this world, if you dissociate the world from name and form, from its associated names and forms, then you can live in the world, look at the world, still without seeing the world, instead of seeing the world, you will be experiencing the all-pervading reality. This can be given, this, may, this can be made clear from another example. Suppose you have before you a large number of dif different types of golden ornaments made of the same gold. Rings, maybe necklaces, innumerable types of golden ornaments in innumerable shapes, sizes, and forms. When we go to a jewelry shop, we may select the ornament on the basis of the shape and form and so on. But suppose you take different ornaments to a goldsmith. He will judge these things only on the basis of the quality of gold of which these ornaments are made. Because he may melt all these and make it gold, again he may make different things. Or if you go to a pot maker, you carry with you different utensils made of clay. The pot maker may judge these utensils only and then he will say, oh, it's all clay only. So if you can look at this world without depending upon the prism of name and form, the relativity, what is called name, forms and causation, the three dimensions of relativity, then you find you are not living the world, you can experience the world to be non-different from the absolute reality. Nama rupa drishtya, mithya, surupa drishtya, brahmaeva. It's a famous statement in Vedanta. When you associate these things in names and forms, with names and forms and shapes and utility, it is a world, this world is a source of pain and conflicts and problems. On the other hand, the same world, you can live in the same world, look at the same world, experience the same world and be part of this world without suffering, without anxiety, without conflicts. Because the world is not different the same absolute reality which means the world has not taken birth the absolute reality never is never reborn the absolute reality never takes the form of this world so sometimes called it the onto phenomenology of consciousness sometimes it's called approach this is Gaudapada's approach. So it is a very unique text. There is a great misunderstanding sometimes. It is very natural. See, we are being taught that the world doesn't exist. It is di very difficult to understand. Now, what does, what does it really mean? The world has no reality. What does it mean? I already explained this earlier. In Vedanta, whatever is changing is not real in the absolute sense. It is only relative. To be called absolutely real 
it should remain the same without any change in the past, present and future. It should not come into existence because coming into existence called birth is a transition or a change from a state of non-existence to a state of existence. Growth, evolution, decay, death, all these, all these are changes. So anything which, is, which belongs to time is non-eternal. Anything which beyond, is beyond time is eternal. The world certainly belongs to time. It is within time. The world perhaps did not exist the way it is existing several millions of years back. And maybe after several millions of years it may, may not exist the way it is existing now. Which means it is relative as relative as an insect which may take birth now and may exist for a few minutes and then vanish. Bacteria or any of these things insignificant. These nano creatures, sometimes they call them, small things. They come into existence, exist for a few minutes and vanish. World comes into existence, exist for, a, for several millions of years and vanish. Both belong to time. So Godapada says, Vedanta says, this is relative. Then what is not relative, what is absolutely real? It is the eternal, everlasting consciousness, Atman. As the inner reality within all of us, it is called Atman. As the all-pervading, omnipresent reality, it is called Brahman. That is Godavada's theory. So all the problems you are facing now are because we identify ourselves with what we are not. We are in reality the eternal, changeless, ever-blissful Atman, consciousness. But we, we identify ourselves with everything else. Everything other than what we really are. That is Godabada's theory. So Vedanta, in that sense, remember Vedanta comes as a great consolation to people living right in the midst of all of us. Even as an intellectual theory, it, it comes, it has a soothing effect. Because mostly people suffer, they suffer conflicts and melancholia, and they commit suicide, they go, they take drinks and drugs, all because they think the problems they are facing are eternal problems. And the sources of the problems are also eternal. The moment they realize that the problems they are facing are not eternal, their causes are also not eternal. The only eternal reality is something else then they will not go out of their way either to create problems for themselves or for others or take resort to undesirable means to run away from themselves. They want People want to run away from themselves, run away from their own memories, disturbing memories and conflicts. Momentary forgetfulness, that's what every, that everybody is seeking. Kudabada says the only solution to this problem is to remind ourselves of what we really are. Sometimes this is, some people ask the question, this is a wonderful idea, but how to experience this? Well, even if we have not fully experienced this, even as an intellectual conviction, it can be a, it can be great help. We may forget this, but again and again, if you remember, by reading, by listening to these ideas, by contemplation, it can become a source of great help and guidance in our day-to-day -day activities. So we have a few minutes since this is the last class of this text. You can ask any questions that you would like to ask, clarification or anything. There will be, I, I should announce, this is the last class before the winter races. The next class will be on Friday, March 14, 2014. Because I will be away for several months. So, if you want, we can have an active discussion. We have got 10 minutes. Either based on what I said today or generally speaking on this text or on a 
general basis, you can raise your points. Oh, oh, oh yes, yeah. The you know, Gaudapada's approach is called the approach of analyzing the absolute reality on the basis of the three states of consciousness in our daily experience: waking state, dream state, deep sleep state. Waking, the, these are called each state is called avastha in Sanskrit. Avastha traya means the three state. Avastha trevicharya means the approach in Vedanta on the basis of the three states of human consciousness. Sometimes it is called avastha prakriya, a particular approach, methodology in Vedanta. Vedanta. In Vedanta there are innumerable approaches and methodologies. This is one of them. And this is a celebrated one. And it was Gaudapada who for the first time, historically speaking, who expounded this idea. So the approach is purely psychological. You go to Bada doesn't ask you to go to a place and worship and pray. Go to Bada doesn't object that. He is all for going to a temple, pray. He is a great supporter. But he says, even from a purely logical point of view, you can establish the reality of Vedanta. That is something very interesting. Godapada's approach is purely based on logic and rational thinking. There is absolutely no theological burden in this. That is that's the uniqueness of this approach. Purely rational. He will be very happy to meet modern atheists and agnostics. He will consider them to be good for good food for him. Because his approach, Godapada's Kariga exp I mean commented upon by Shankaracharya is a unique uh, philosophical work, the original work. It uh, abounds in different psychological and philosophical ideas and approaches, purely based on logical, he says. <coughs> yes. Now, there is, of course, there is a there's a minor difference in approach. See, Gaudapada emphasizes the idea of non-origination, the non-reality of the world. Shankaracharya uh, emphasizes not only the absolute reality of Brahman, but he also points out the relativity, relativity of this world. The world is relatively real. That point is very clearly accepted by Shankaracharya. Godavada's point is the world is only relatively real. Shankaracharya says the world, world has got a relative existence. So, in Gaudab in, there, is, there is a celebrated sentence in Shankaracharya's commentary Bhashya Prak Brahmatna Vijnana Sarva Loka Vivakaranam Satyatu Vapatthihi Yadha Sopnandrishtu Seva Prak Prabodhat When I explain this statement you will understand the implication of what I was telling earlier. Here Shankaracharya says just as before you wake up from a dream dream objects are real to you Similarly, these worldly experiences are real or we should consider them as if they are real before you realize Brahman. So, see, Shankaracharya's system is more compact. It is a full-fledged metaphysical edifice. Godabada's system is not so comprehensive. He takes up one aspect of Advaita Vedanta and he emphasizes that point. So, see Shankaracharya, he says, Satyat is Sarva Loka Vivakaranam Satyatu Papati. Means what he says, before you, you realize the supreme reality, before you become a knower of Brahman, you have to live in this world. 
you have to do your work and duties and responsibilities without desire for the results you should practice nishkama karma the yoga of disinterested action and then when you realize the supreme reality you can go beyond this before that you have to work hard by practicing disinterested action karma yoga gudapada doesn't bother about that gudapada sits on the top of the hill and proclaims the conclusion of vedanta shankaracharya takes you by your hand and makes you climb the hill and takes you to the top that's all gudapada doesn't lend a ladder for others to climb he declares it from the top but shankaracharya he provides you a ladder and takes you step by step to the top that's a difference Nikhilanandaji's translation is fully based on Shankaracharya's interpretation. Eh? Yes, Nikhilanandaji has given a translation of Shankaracharya's uh, Kariga Bhashya. See, Shankaracharya is not the author of Kariga. He is the author of the Bhashya on the Kariga, which was written by Godapada. So, Kariga itself is a commentary on the Upanishads. so the in fact uh, perhaps nikhilananda ji's translation is the most dependable and perhaps the best translation of shankaracharya's bhashya it is a is a complete translation of shankaracharya with footnotes and after writing this he got it edited by great uh, traditional scholar like subramanya iyer and many see subramanya who was a prominent god of the specialist of that age so it still continues to be the best translation of kariga bhashya any other others yes in fact whatever we do with a strong motive creates a, a block in our spiritual path whatever we do without this without the desire for the results removes that block so that's a daily experience when we do things without a motive with a great with great concentration uh, slowly our mind elevates and along with that if we keep reading these ideas uh, the truth of these ideas the relevance of these ideas become more and more obvious to us so karma yoga is the first step in fact gudapada doesn't bother much about different approaches to us real, realizing this ideal but in shankaracharya's books he gives elements to the problems of common seekers the beginners the students and he is more broad minded in that respect so karma yoga is the first step and very logical step so i will conclude before that again once more i am reading the announcement this is the last class before the winter recess the next class will be on friday march the 14th 2014 om shanti